So I was really upset that my animation didn't work, so I fixed it. And now I need to show it to you. Voila. OK, here are going to be our, um, our sugar molecules. This is a sensory receptor cell. You now know that if it is experiencing sugar, it's experiencing a chemical, which makes it a chemoreceptor cell. And so these would actually be the little receptor proteins, theoretically, on the surface of it. And when there is sugar molecules that bind to those receptors, then it'll cause a sensory receptor cell to send out an action potential that gets called a receptor potential, right? And we talked about the five types of chemoreceptor cells, five categories of chemoreceptors of sensory receptor cells that you need to know. And we learned that the first three, mechanoreceptors, chemoreceptors, and photoreceptors, I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about those. Although I would like you to also know that there are thermoreceptors that allow you to experience temperature and nociceptors that would allow you to experience pain. Okay. Now, the five human senses are touch, hearing, taste, smell, and vision. And they're in different colors, and those different colors are not arbitrary. I've got touch and hearing here in blue because I wrote mechanoreceptors in blue. I wrote chemoreceptors in green, and it's true that your sense of taste and your sense of smell, these are both chemoreceptor senses. And then your sense of vision is a photoreceptor sense and is our only one that we know of, <clears throat> all right? So touch, hearing, taste, smell, and vision. So let's talk a little bit more about the quirkiness of sensation. I remember um, gosh, kind of a long time ago when I was in, still in high school um, that I was wondering whether if I could see the colors I was thinking about colors for some reason, uh, through your brain, um, if the colors would look the same color to me. In other words, everyone learns that this color is blue, but that doesn't mean we're actually seeing the same color. You get me? So um, there actually are many baffling things about uh, the whole idea of sensation. Um, there are flavors, for example, that uh, many of us cannot taste. There is a, a very simple uh, biotechnology lab um, that gets done <clears throat> where uh, an entire class full of people will taste these little pieces of paper. And if you're me, you have got two useless alleles for the protein that would allow me to taste that particular flavor. So I put these papers in my mouth and I'm like, it just kind of tastes like paper, you know? Whereas people that have functional alleles for the sensation of that particular chemical, they'll just barely touch it to the tip of their tongue eh, and they go, oh my God, that's like such a bitter flavor, right? Now, you, if you were me and you were not scientific, you would go, nonsense, you're just making it up. You can't really taste anything, it's all in your brain. Well, sensation is all in our brain in a way, but uh, the truth is we can actually uh, very simply look at the genetics of the different members of the class. So in a class of 30 students, there will usually be about 10 people like me that don't taste it, and about 10 people that are really good at tasting it, and 10 people that can taste it, but it's not that strong. And when we look at their genes, we see that people like me have two broken alleles. People who can kind of taste it have one broken allele and one functional allele. And people that it's really strong have two functioning alleles. That means that just by definition, just genetically, just matter of fact on paper, we are not experiencing the world in the same way. Uh, we'll talk about dogs um, when we get to them, but that's one of the reasons why we like having dogs around is because they do sense things that are in the environment that we can't sense. Now, how does the brain even know what you're sensing? And by this, I mean, I told you that all of the sensory neurons are the same. The, the receptor nerve cells, those are different, but all the sensory ones carrying the information to the brain, they're all the same. 
and their action potentials are all the same. So when that arrives in my brain, how do I know whether I'm seeing yellow or seeing red? How do I know if I'm seeing a color or hearing a sound? And actually, the reason is that that neuron is attached to the part of your brain that will always process an action potential that arrives as being a certain sense. For example, this part of your temporal lobe of your brain, it is only meant to process hearing. So any action potential that arrives there will be processed as a sound. Any action potential that arrives here will be processed as visual stimulus, right? Any action potential that arrives here, it will be processed as a smell. That means that if there, are oh, well, you don't know the way eyeballs uh, develop when you're still a baby inside your mom, but there are neurons that are born inside of the eyeball and while you're still inside of your mom, they will grow their axons, you know, axons, they'll grow their axons out of the eyeball, down the optic nerve, across the optic chiasm or not, half, half and half. And then they will grow their way through the thalamus and end up back here, back here in the visual portion of the brain. So they have got a long journey to make. What if that axon on its way to the brain, occipital lobe where it processes vision, what if it got lost and instead it arrived right here in the temporal lobe of the brain? Well, what would happen would be every time the right wavelength of light stimulated that particular uh, cell in your eye, it would end up sounding like a sound. Now, that actually does happen, and it has a name. It is called synesthesia. Synesthesia is this sort of crossing over of the perception of sensation. So uh, synesthesia is not as simple as my description here. It is much more complicated. But one set of synesthesia symptoms is that people will hear a certain sound, like a sound that the doorbell makes, and it tastes sour, right? Or they will, they will hear a certain orchestral piece, and when the violins make a certain sound, it smells like roses, right? Or they will taste something, and they will hear a very particular note, usually not something orchestral, but a very particular note. And why might that be happening? Well, one reason it can happen is if there is a cell that is connected to all the mechanics of your ear, so it is uh, set up to uh, send out an action potential when it experiences a certain sound, if the axon of that cell ends up going to the visual part of your brain, then a certain note on the piano is yellow. And you would know that, right? Now, we used to think that this was really rare. Turns out it's not very rare. It just seems rare because who would ever talk about it? You know, we learn sounds and tastes and smells and names for them when they're little kids. And it would never occur to you if the doorbell always tastes sour or if when the doorbell rings, it looks yellow in your head, you just think that everyone understands that that's the sound of the doorbell, right? Well, that's what I taught you. You hear the sound of the doorbell, you go, what's that? I say, that's the sound of the doorbell. But your experience is sound plus a color. You think, well, that is the sound of a doorbell. So it would never occur to you to even talk about it. Instead of being like a misfiring, some people believe that synesthesia is actually one of the strengths of the human mind. To prove that, they use this experiment that I will do on you, all right? Here you are, you are looking at these two shapes in front of you on the computer, and I want you to decide which one you would name Booba and which one you would name Kiki. Booba and Kiki. Now, 
If you are like 99.8% of people on the planet, not just English speakers, but everyone, you know that this one over here should be named Booba and this one over here should be named Kiki. As a matter of fact, if you are the kind of person who named this one Booba, almost always the reason you did it is because it pleases you to name things backwards. But don't you understand that even if you said, I'm gonna name this one Booba and this one Kiki because that would be funny, even if you said that, you are agreeing that this one should be called Booba and this one should get the name Kiki. But wait a minute, these are just two dimensional shapes on a screen. You cannot touch them. You cannot hold them in your hand and turn them around. Why would one be called Kiki and one be called Booba? And the answer is interesting because it shows you the way the human mind works. We say to ourselves that this is sharp and this is round, right? Now, they're neither, right? Because we cannot touch them. And sharp is something you can touch. But we imagine that if this were three-dimensional, and if this were three-dimensional, if we could touch them, this would feel sharp and that would feel round. Great, okay. Still doesn't explain the names, does it? Except for Kiki, even if you don't know what the letters look like, Kiki is a sharp sound and Booba is a round sound. Again, why? Now, you might say, oh, yes, well, if I saw uh, on a uh, sonography screen, if I saw someone saying Kiki, it would have sharp peaks. Okay, you might be right, but that's not why we say that. Most of us don't know what Kiki would look like if we measured it in wavelengths, right? But we do know that Kiki sounds sharp to us. We make the sounds like little short, little sharp sounds. See, I even have to use the word sharp to describe sudden brief sounds. Kiki is sudden and brief. Booba is slower and our mouth moves. Ah, oh, it's exhausting, right? But that's the way humans are. As a matter of fact, that's the way poetry is, right? Her voice was like honey right? Her skin was like gardenias, okay? Like we're always viewing, like his glance was like a knife. And we're always confusing the two things. And so many people feel that this is one of the strengths of the human mind, that because we can take different sensations and find a way of blending them, we can use all of our senses in order to come up with solutions to complicated problems. It also allows us to think um, theoretically. In other words, I don't need to be holding these two images to come up with a solution for which one would make a better knife, right? I can take what I'm seeing as two-dimensional, imagine it three-dimensional, and imagine the way the three-dimensional one would act as a knife. Okay. Kind of interesting, right? We're going to start there at the beginning of our next lecture with the sense of touch.